Hey everyone, welcome to my work in progress YouTube and podcast and audiobook studio. Uh, at some point in the near future, I've got to get a chalkboard and then also paint the walls white in part so that when I'm taking a Zoom call from home, people can't tell if I'm just in a pre-war building or in my basement. All right, here is an annotated reading of chapter two, and this chapter means a lot to me because it has really informed my deepest intuitions about force and energy, which I never really quite understood from physics in as a freshman and sophomore undergrad. Um, but once I put things into the context of Van der Waals forces and um, gravity and entropy and started thinking about the force being the rate of change of the potential energy as opposed to energy being the integral of the work done, uh, so integral of the energy uh, to create the system. It really clicked in my mind, so hopefully it does for you uh, as well. Okay, forces between atoms, ions, and molecules. There are two types of forces that exist between individual atoms, ions, and molecules. The first type is based on the formal sharing of electrons, that is, covalent bonds, which you may have learned about in your chemistry class. The second type is based on electrostatic interactions, that is, coulombic interactions between objects with formal charges and partial charges in the form of dipoles. A subset of coulombic interactions include the van der Waals forces arising from dipole-dipole, dipole-induced dipole, and dispersion interactions, often called London dispersion interactions, named after the town of London. Actually, no, it was named after a person named London. The importance of such interactions in predicting the behavior of physical, chemical, and biological systems stems from the fact that they exist between all atoms, ions, and molecules at all times, even charged species. Ooh. While not all atoms are capable of forming covalent bonds with each other, every atom or molecule experiences van der Waals interactions with every other atom or molecule in its vicinity. Although it does drop off over a certain distance because of the speed of light, which is finite, and I'll tell you about that more in a few uh, minutes. Most biological functions and much of the behavior of matter arise from these interactions. Energy and force. Phenomena that occur on the nanoscale arise from a few guiding principles. First off, just like the items in your nicely once organized desk or bedroom, things tend to spread out. In physics, this tendency is sometimes due to entropy. That is, there are more ways for charges, particles, and molecules to be spread out than there are for the same items to be arranged neatly. Thus, the individual components of systems tend to adjust themselves such that they are spread out as much as possible. In the case of particles with the same charge, for example, a bunch of negatively charged ions spreading out is due to electrostatic repulsion of the charges. That is, spreading out is due to an electrostatic repulsion of the charges. <laughs> Who's producing this album anyway? <laughs> In fact, even a solitary charge will experience, quote, self-repulsion and take up as much volume as possible. When particles and charges spread out, the potential energy is lower when the same species are confined. See figure 2.1 for examples of systems with high and low potential energy. Okay, now this is one of those don't let the facts get in the way of clarity things. Um, what I'm showing here is that if all else is created equal, you have high potential energy if you're standing on a hill, you have a high potential energy if you have two like charges pressed up against each other and low potential energy if they're spread out, and if you have a bunch of non-interacting particles like an ideal gas, you have high potential potential energy when everything is spread out and then, or sorry, when everything is clustered together and when it's spread out, it is due uh, to uh, lowering the potential energy because of the increase in entropy. Okay. Differences in potential energy of states lead to physical forces that drive changes to occur. These forces act to decrease the potential energy of the system, moving it from high potential energy to low potential energy. For example, the high gravitational potential energy of standing at the top of a hill to the low potential energy of standing at the base of the hill. The potential energies of confined systems tend to be larger than those of relaxed systems. The higher energies associated with confined systems lead to greater 
driving forces for change to occur. For example, there is a comparatively larger difference in the free energies of the products and reactants in a chemical reaction when one of the reactants is reactants is constrained in some way. Picture a ring-shaped molecule that wants to open up to form a linear chain. The reasons are both entropic and quantum mechanical. Or consider the fact that a small ion whose charge is confined and uptight has more to gain by associating with an ion of the opposite charge than a large ion whose charge is spread out and relaxed. Finally, when particles such as electrons are confined to small spaces, for example, in a quantum dot, they can absorb, emit, or scatter photons of larger energies, that is, smaller wavelengths, of light. If this does not make sense now, energy, entropy, absorption, emission, etc., do not worry. Our goal by the end of this book is to help you understand them. It is worth taking a closer look at what we mean by energy and force. In physics and chemistry that you might have seen in high school, a significant emphasis is placed on the distinction between potential energy and kinetic energy. You probably spent several weeks talking about kinematics of billiard balls, projectiles, and ballistic trajectories. Indeed, kinetic energy is useful when discussing the kinetic theory of gases along with dissipative processes such as friction. However, in nanoengineering and in the dynamics of molecules and particles in a solution, potential energy is a more useful concept than kinetic energy. The reason for this emphasis is that we are more interested in understanding how a system came to be and how it might change rather than how fast its individual components are moving, which is the purview of kinetic energy. The potential energy of a system is equal to the work needed positive work, or done, negative work, to bring the system into existence. I should say that that positive and negative work uh, conventions are really just conventions, and they're not necessarily uh, a hard and true fact about the universe, and we'll talk about that later. It all depends on your reference state and what you're going to call negative and positive. So you could, but you could just got to be consistent. If the potential energy um, of two positive charges close together uh, is increased compared to when they're far away, that's the convention we're using. But if it's, but if you say it's decreased, then you know people might say that in a parallel universe. But it's not what we say here. It's not necessarily going to give you the wrong answer. You just need to be consistent about how you label these energies. To deconstruct the system, to take all of the atoms and molecules and separate them to infinity requires the same amount of energy but with the opposite sign. When a system consisting of objects of any size has a lower potential, a lower energy than all of the components considered separately, the system has favorable, i.e. negative, by our convention, potential energy. Potential energy is deeply connected to the concept of force. Force is the rate of change of potential energy with respect to some change in the system. It turns out that these seemingly abstract concepts control a vast range of natural phenomena when applied on the nanoscale. For example, from properties of substances such as the stickiness of glue and the cleaning power of soap to basically all of chemistry and biology. Electrostatic interactions. Let's make these broad statements more concrete. Say you have two charged particles. They could be made of plastic, metal, or rock, or even single ions like sodium plus and, and chloride minus, whose centers are separated by distance r. Like this. Sodium chloride separated by distance r. Anytime two objects, including atoms, ions, molecules, fingers, buildings, or planets, are near each other, there is some kind of potential energy between them, or interaction energy, or interaction potential, or potential energy of interaction. You get the point. Think of the gravitational potential between you and the Earth when you are at a high point, like on a diving board. On the diving board, your potential energy is high. On the ground, it is low. The potential energy between two particles, atoms, ions, and molecules, can either be high or low at a given separation, depending on how the objects are charged. Particles with like charges, i.e. two negatives, have high potential energy. Those with unlike charges have lower potential energy. In either case, the potential 
potential energy changes as the particles move closer together or farther apart. If we are talking about small numbers of atoms, ions, and molecules, the dominant source of potential energy is electrostatic. That is, opposite charges attract and like charges repel. Words like attract and repel refer to the force of the interaction. However, we account for this interaction on our balance sheet using energy. The reason is that the energy, not the force, that must be conserved in any process. <clears throat> that is to say, it is the energy, not the force, that needs to be conserved in any process. In this chapter and throughout the book, when we say energy, we are almost always talking about the potential energy. To drive home that po the point, in nanoscale interactions, we generally do not care much about the kinetic energy, that is, the energy of movement. Exceptions arise when we need to deal with the effects of that result Exceptions arise when we need to deal with effects that result from the motion of large numbers of particles, like the pressure exerted by gases and frictional forces. In these cases, kinetic energy plays an important role. The potential energy of a generic interaction is given by W of R equals C over R to the N, where W of R is the potential energy of interaction between two objects, C is a constant that takes into account the properties of these two interacting objects, R is the separation between the centers of these two objects, and N is an integer related to the type of interaction. For electrostatic energy, N equals 1 and C for Coulomb's law equals Q1, Q2 over 4 pi epsilon naught, where Q represents the charges of the ions and epsilon naught is a permittivity of free space. The constant E is the fundamental charge or the charge of an electron or proton. Here are the equations that I have been talking about. If you're watching on the screen, you can pause it there. Okay. If one charge is negative and the other is positive, the overall potential energy is negative. It is useful to break Q values down into two components, Z and E, where Z is the valency. For sodium plus 1, Z equals 1. For calcium plus 2, Z equals 2, and so on. What does it mean to have a negative potential energy? Before answering the question, it is worth considering what the potential energy actually means. The potential energy is equivalent to the work done in order to bring the objects together. In this thought experiment, the particles are initially separated by infinite distance. In the case of two oppositely charged particles, which in a sense want to interact, it takes negative work. That is, the system essentially does the work for you. It would have taken some effort to bring, sorry, to bring particles with the same charge in close proximity, it would have taken some effort, which is positive work. It is sometimes thought that a negative potential energy between two objects implies an attractive force. This simple assumption is often true, but not always. The more important criterion for determining the type of force, attractive or repulsive, than the sign of the energy at fixed separation is what happens to the energy when the particles move closer together or farther apart. That is, does the energy increase or decrease? If the potential energy decreases when objects come closer together, the force between the objects is attractive. If it increases, the force is repulsive. So the sign of the potential energy at fixed separation R, whether it is negative or positive, means nothing in terms of force. What matters is the rate of change of the energy W of R with respect to separation R. This rate of change is equal to the force F of R equals minus DWR dr. Uh, there it is where D refers to small incremental differences in either energy, numerator, or separation, denominator. We need to have the negative sign out front to make sure that attractive interactions result in negative forces. Convince yourselves by putting the sign of the overall force in the square brackets in this scheme uh, here. Note that the convention that negative force implies attractive interaction is arbitrary just for convenience and consistency. 
Negative or decreasing quantities imply driving force or stability of a system relative to a reference state. A reference state is almost always considered to be a system of particles that do not interact, as in when they are held at infinite distance. We close this section by saying that the above arguments and equations are valid for all charged objects of any size, from ions to charged plastic spheres. Thank you.